You know what? The vast array of stagnant ponds that saturate this forest is terribly inconvenient. We have to search high and low for a spot to set up camp that doesn't have this overwhelming scent of hydrogen sulphide and decaying organic matter lingering over us. The smell is that of the most vilest description. It does look very serene though, right? Kinda purdy. 10 out of 10, wood bank. Well, would you look at that boost? That really is quite sinister. It looks like something that rolled straight out of Mordor and is about to lay siege on Minas Tirith. But I know what this is. That's a caterpillar. Not the typical friendly green caterpillar, however. This is an Inicus Io, or Eo, otherwise known as the peacock butterfly, or what will eventually become the peacock butterfly. It's so strange how this ugly motherfucker will emerge from its chrysalis as a purdy little butterfly. Chrysalis, yo. Not a cocoon. Moths come out of cocoons, butterflies come out of a chrysalis. What do you know about that entomology? 10 out of 10, would not even consider messing with. Although, he won't be so hard when he's got a bottle of Magnus wrapped around the back of his head. And here we have a much more welcoming caterpillar. The caterpillar of what I now know to be the Cinnabar Moth, Tyria Jacobae. Purdy little thing, chilling on the Jacobae at Vulgaris plant, otherwise known as Ragwort. Common plant that's saturated amongst the meadows. Toxic plant, however, should whack up an image of the full flower. It's pretty common, you've probably seen it, at least here in the UK. Can't speak on behalf of America. Got a Tyria Jacobae, chilling on a Jacobae vulgaris plant. See the connection? Cool. Usually find it amongst all the fireweed, which at this time of year is about eight feet tall. Edible plant, tastes wonderful. We'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> he started going skits. Look at that. Busting dance rituals that put Zed outdoors to shame. Maybe he's intimidated by the presence. Maybe he knows I'm Indiana Jones. How about that? This is fireweed, or Chimerian angustifolium. It's edible in every stage of development, but certain parts of the plant are more desirable in different stages. The stem is what's on the table today, and there's some ragwort chilling in amongst it. Fireweed for days over there, though. Let's have a gander. That's a nice shot. Very dignified plant. Let's cut it open and eat it. The leaves, in particular the younger leaves when picked earlier in the year, can be used to make tea, or kapoya tea as it's known in Russia. Very pleasant, would recommend. But these ones are just too old for that now, so never mind. The entirety of the plant is edible if you really want to chow down, but the best part is inside. Inside the stem is a white pith and this is incredibly nutrient dense. It's a cheeky little nibble, let's put it that way. Scrape it out and chow down. Vinerals and vitamins, vinerals and vitamins, minerals and vitamins are the saving grace with this plant. It's not the easiest job to do with a BK7, but there you go. God damn, my knife is filthy. Give that a scrub in a moment. You can get a lot out if you scrape the entirety of the eight foot tall stem or several tastes very pleasant. It's a bit like watermelon, but not as melony. So you could just say it tastes like water, I guess. Consider it nature's multivitamin, however. But hey, pro tip. Ragwort and fireweed all tend to grow on what's known as calcareous soil, which is soil that contains a lot of calcium carbonate, often chalk, to simplify it. So if you think back to Campus Fetix 8, I spoke about where to find flint and chur and such, and where flint typically develops, in and amongst calcium carbonate, or chalk. So, chalky ground, you'll more than likely find nodules of flint in and amongst these areas. Usually surrounded by a layer of calcium carbonate, however, so can be deceiving at first. You've got to smash the rocks open to expose the flint. Example one, a glorious mass of sedimentary cryptocrystalline, flint, found amongst a calcareous soil that is host to ragwort and fireweed. I've got spearheads for days. Bit windy millers though, came over all dark and cloudy as soon as I pulled this out of the soil. Don't think Mother Nature approves of the antics. Got some King Arthur action going on over here. Sun's back out, thankfully, because I need the sun. How are we making fire today? Well, I've got tinder fungus for days. So what we're gonna do is take the lens off my headlamp and use this convex lens as an impromptu magnifying glass. Hooray. I love this part delicately slicing it up. The usual story is that the clouds roll up every time I go to do a skill that relies on the sun, but not today. Been blessed. Takes a while. 
small lens, small amount of light that's captured, small focal point. Although it does look very luminous on the camera. It's smoking but I want to be thorough. I'll go balls deep on this. Switch angles for a better view. Smoking like a good one, that should do it. Let's take a moment to bust a big daddy magnifying glass, make some artwork. And this is the state of affairs after about 12 minutes of burn time. Still got plenty of life left in it. I wedged it behind the cap of my knee pad. That kept it safe and sound. I was walking around with smoking knee. It was pretty cool. Felt like a goddamn Persian magician. Now we just need to let that burn down into a nice bed of coals. Then we'll start cooking. Gordon Ramsay up in here. What are we cooking? Well, we're gonna make some wild coffee from Gallium Aparine. What is Gallium Aparine? This plant is Gallium Aparine. Should be a familiar sight for most of you. If you don't immediately recognize this plant, then goddamn, did you live under a rock as a child? But some common names are sticky bugs, of course. Sometimes they're called gooseberry. Don't call it gooseberry. That name belongs to another plant. Um, sometimes called goose grass, sticky weed, but mostly they're called cleavers. Why are they called sticky bugs and such? Because they stick to your clothing as they have Velcro-like barbs. So that's one characteristic that helps with positive identification. The scientific name is Gallium Aparine, but there's several ways you could pronounce that. Number one, you could pronounce it incorrectly like it's a chemical, Gallium Aparine, like myself. Or you could be a bit more try-hard and call it Gallium or Gallium. But whatevs, you know, edibility, let's talk about that. But before we do, let's talk about allergic reactions. A lot of people, myself included, are allergic to this plant. You'll just have to find out the hard way whether you are or not. But if you are, if the plant or the barb specifically brush up or abrade your skin, then it blows your skin up into a huge rash through what's known as contact dermatitis. Shouldn't be enough to put you off using this plant though. It's only a minor inconvenience. Just don't exfoliate yourself with it. You can eat the root, you can eat the stems. Wouldn't recommend the stems. You can eat the leaves, fruits and seeds. So the entirety of the plant is edible. The barbs that make this plant notorious for clinging to your clothes can be irritating if they get stuck in your throat, but you can blanch the plant over the fire like you would with nettles. My recommendation is to pick the top parts of the plant, the fresh growths. I find it tastes quite sweet in comparison to the rest of the plant. As the plant ages, it becomes a bit more acrid. Plus, the fresh growths tend to have a lot less coarse barbs to deal with, so 3-4 inches from the top is my recommendation. Good to go, chow down. You'll find as you head down the plant, it tastes increasingly more bitter and the barbs are quite rough. But the real kicker with this plant is the fruit. These little balls are indeed a fruit, they contain the seeds of the plant. But what we can do with these is dry them out by roasting them in a cup over the fire. Grind them into a powder and then dilute it in hot water to create a coffee substitute. This plant belongs to the same family as the actual coffee plant, the Rubiaceae family of plants. So. Let's make some coffee. Although I'm topically allergic to it, I don't experience any allergies when eating or drinking it. So let's get cracking. A batch of this size would produce a very weak cup. So I'll be using four times the amount for the coffee. Free tinder though, all the down thistle seeds. Easy game for a ferrocerium rod. So I took one for the team and lightly grazed my wrist with some gallium aparine to show you my allergic reaction to it. Contact dermatitis right there. It looks and feels a bit like a mild chemical burn. 
very light blistering of the skin and some inflammation. In hindsight, I should have rubbed it on my forearm rather than my wrist because the cuff of my gloves is now just going to scratch the hell out of this all day. <laughs> I've done goofed. These are what the fruits look like after two to three minutes of roasting in a cup over the fire. Now all we need to do is grind it into a powder. Oh yeah, that's it baby. Now just let the fire do the rest of the work. Bring that to a boil, then sit back. Enjoy the beverages. Check out Sean's cup. If you observe, you may find that the fruits pop and jump about, like popcorn. Look at that. Captivating. Slow day at Camp Aesthetics, watching fruits mimic corn kernels. Oh yeah, you stir that bad boy Sean a cuss. You stir that with your stick. Hashtag roughing it. Not a filthy spoon user like myself, no sir. That's looking good. That's a nice rich brown colour. Well, kind of rich. But I will say it tastes a lot more pleasant than it looks. Genuinely looking forward to drinking something covered in plain Jane water. So, what can you expect to taste? Well, it has a mild remnant of the typical coffee taste that we all know and love. Excuse me. It's nice. It's pleasant. It's hard to describe what gallium aparine tastes like because it doesn't really taste like anything else. As a whole, I would describe it as an earthy, weak, green coffee. But hey, I like it. 10 out of 10. Would consume on a regular basis. Well, would you look at that? Ain't that just gorgeous? Them vibrant colours. Let's talk about these buttes, just for the sake of knowing what things are. What are they? These little jelly fingers are a fungus called small staghorns. The genus they belong to is Calicera, and an on the fly identifier of the species would be Calicera cornea. Popping out of dead and decaying deadfall. Kind of purdy, right? But there's a much more elaborate and striking species though the yellow staghorn Calicera viscosa, which more so resemble antlers. They're a lot more majestic, but they're edible in the sense that they're not toxic, but they don't taste like anything. They're a bit boring, they're a bit gelatinous. It's a bit of a Tremelo Mesenterica kind of deal there, but I personally like them. Reminds me of bean sprouts. Got a little bit of texture to them, so if you're on that knocking up wild gourmet food shit, you may get points for both presentation and texture of the whole palette if you throw these in. Pro tip. If you want to impress the bitches, not like Tremella Mesenterica though, which has now been officially classified as quite unpleasant. Looks like coral, right? It's one of my favourite fungi for the sole reason that yellow is my favourite colour. I'm easily pleased. <laughs> Let's try another one. Oh, that one was rubbish. Get off the tree, you bastard. Right. <laughs> that was a good one. Well, I'm easily amused. These knobbly fruiting plants are called Arum maculatum, otherwise known as wild Arum. Long story short, it's a toxic plant. Considerably so. But it goes by several other names. Cuckoo pine, lords and ladies, Adam and Eve, cows and bulls. Could go on and it gets those gender-based names from the two prominent stages of development of this plant. Its flowering stage looks like a pussy, or technical term vagina, and its fruiting stage, I suppose by comparison, looks like a big old dick. So that's why it has the gender-associated common names. But those names are silly. It makes the plant sound welcoming. It's not intimidating enough considering how toxic this plant is, which is what I feel is responsible for the fact that this plant in particular is responsible for a lot of poisoning of kids in this country. Because they think, oh, that's lords and ladies. It sounds nice. It looks nice. Oh my God, why does it feel like I'm getting stabbed in the stomach? Why does it feel like I've swallowed acid? Because it just burns all the way down, man. Lovely to look at, not lovely to consume, unfortunately. Time for some cheeky nibbles, my friends. These red fruits are what's on the menu today. These are known as rose hips. They are the fruits of the Rosa canina tree, more commonly known as the dog rose tree. 
Rosa, Rose, Canina, Canine, Dog, you dig it? Cool. Another name it goes by is Witch's Briar, which is a strange name. I wouldn't use that name because it makes the tree sound intimidating and toxic, right? It's not. The fruits are totally fine to eat. Seeds are another question. We'll get to that in a jiffy. I'm just going to pick me some of these bad boys, go to town on them. So we've got our rose hips, and these fruits are one of the highest sources of L ascorbic acid, or otherwise known as vitamin C, out there. A nice find, and pretty delicious too, they're very tarty. I won't eat them as is though, I'm going to cut them open and scrape the seeds out. Why? Well, primarily because the seeds are really hairy, they do irritate the hell out of your throat. It's definitely a <laughs> kind of deal. This plant and fruit is a member of the Roseaceae family. Thus it is speculated to contain some considerable quantities of cyanogenic glycosides Fuck me, that was a bit of a tongue twister and hydrogen cyanide within its cells Much like how apple seeds do, almonds, peaches, cherry pips they're all members of the Roseaceae family too but not all species and genera within that family do Some people will argue till they're blue in the face that these seeds do but I personally can't find any evidence to back that up other than people putting two and two together Oh, Rosiaceae family, oh, I must have cyanide in. Because my apples, my peaches. But I think that's a load of total bovine rectal excrement, but whatever. Not going to eat them anyway, for unrelated reasons. That fungi, though. I sense there's going to be a lot of fungi in this video today. It's been a wet summer, man. And a wet summer is one of the core ingredients in the recipe for fungi for days. So if you like learning about fungi, well, that's good. You go and learn to know, but if you couldn't care less about fungi, well that's a bunch of tough potatoes, you're just going to have to deal with it, won't you? So what is this cluster of fungi? Gymnopus fulzippers, if you want the Latin, but they're otherwise known as spindle shanks, or spindle tough shanks. Cool name, right? Spindle shank. Sounds like an intimidating fellow you'd encounter in prison, you know? Alright, listen here, mate. Any more of your lip and I'll get spindle shank down here, sort you fucking right out. Oh look, here he comes now, you best keep your head down boy. And then spindle shank comes over like, give me that ass boy. But right, why are they called spindle shanks? Well, the base of the stipe is pretty damn pointy for a fungus, which is a unique characteristic or a taxonomical feature that can help with identification with this fungus. Along with it being rather twisted, deformed and flat, that comes with age. Otherwise, they tend to be very fat and chody. Are they edible? Well, they're not toxic. You can eat them. It's just very difficult to eat them because they're so tough. Another generic term for this group of fungi is indeed tough shanks, and rightly so because chewing on them is like chewing on pure meat gristle. Your jaws will tend to give out before you actually manage to process it down. Bit of an exaggeration, but they're tough. Boiling them or grilling them doesn't make them any easier to eat, unfortunately. And I say unfortunately because they taste mildly like onions. So it would be a cheeky nibble, but they are certainly good for cleaning your teeth. If you use it like a dog chew, you know. But there you go. You can eat them if you want, give your jaw a bit of a workout. You may end up looking like Edward Cullen. Well, well, well. What have we got here then? A pair of ordinary stones? No. This is a fungus. A fungus known as an earth ball. Very similar to stinkhorn eggs and puffballs in terms of their anatomy, but a whole different kettle of fish. This earth ball is called Scleroderma citrinum. Scler meaning hard, derma meaning skin, scleroderma hard skin. Which is accurate, as this outer layer, known as the peridium, is like pig skin. It's tough. It's a hard skin that encloses the spores of the fungus. We'll cut it open and have a gander inside in a moment. It goes by a few common names though, such as the common earth ball or pigskin poison puffball. Which sounds pretty nice, but as neat as that sounds, don't call it that because it's not a puffball. Puffballs are a totally different fungus. Perhaps we'll see some later in the day. So what is this and what does it do? Let's cut it open and have a gander inside. Enclosed in that pigskin like outer layer is a dark mass of spores. These are the spores of the fungus, that when the fungus matures will be all dusty and dispersed by the wind. Similar to a puffball in that regard. 
The dark mass of spores enclosed within that outer layer is known as the gleba, if you're interested in technical terms. The outer shell, if you will, is called the peridium. Compare that to a puffball, which too is composed of a gleba and peridium. Compare that to a stinkhorn, which also has a gleba and a three-tiered peridium. So these ball fungi are pretty unique. Certainly is quite interesting. These are poisonous though, as the common name pigskin poison puffball would suggest. Quite hard to find at that too. I only inadvertently stumbled across these as I dropped my lighter on the ground here. So it's very easy to just pass them off as small pebbles. But there's not much else to say about these earth balls. They're not edible, they're not medicinal, not very useful for anything. But an interesting find nonetheless. And here we have a different species of tough shanks. To be more specific, these are called clustered tough shanks. Kind of similar to the spindle shanks, right? The flat, deformed stipe is a feature that crosses over. Not pointy though, so they're not spindle shanks. Same genus though. Another identifiable characteristic amongst the tough shanks is that if you split them thoroughly, you will see they're incredibly fibrous. So, tough, fibrous, sometimes twisted and deformed, flattened stipes, pretty hipster mushroom. Breaks the mould a bit. Very common fungi though. It does have lookalikes though, one being the sulphur tuft. Its scientific name is a bit of a mouthful, it's known as Hypholoma fasciculaire. Almost identical at a glance because they grow in clusters, they have very crowded gills, they're a similar colour, but one differentiating taxonomical feature is the regularity of the sulphur tuft stipe. It's a lot more rounded and much more richer and oranger in colour overall. It would be a bad thing to do, mistaking the two, because sulphur tufts are toxic and quite potently toxic too. Stomach cramps and nausea is what's on the table with those. So when I say these are edible to a degree, it's best just not to bother with them really. They're hard to chew, they don't taste that nice, and mistaking them for a common toxic lookalike is a real possibility for the inexperienced, but you can do whatever the fuck you want, I don't care. I ain't oppressing. Oh look, it's little babby ones, little babby gymnopus confluence. Ain't that just adorable? Here we have a large confluence of gymnopus confluence. Two slugs fucking each other though. Well, I'm not sure if they're actually doing that. Sean would know, but he's busy collecting snail shells or whatever, like a true entomologist. This tuft of fungi goes all the way around down here. This is a fairy ring. What is a fairy ring, you ask? A fairy ring is a massive bunch of fungi that are connected underground via their mycelium, technical term for their roots. You can see this goes all the way up here. All these orange balls on this moss! Could be one of either three things. Sorry, one of either two things. Nectria cenobarina, the coral spot fungus, although I've never came across it growing on moss. Nectria cenobarina kind of exclusively grows on actual wood, predominantly beech trees. Branches and twigs, you know. Growing on moss, that's unheard of. We'll have a gander through the microscope in a moment to confirm this. But this little baby fungi, I would say that's a Myocena eustalis right off the bat. I say that with confidence and conviction, but not concerned with that. These balls are almost perfectly spherical. I would say that's indeed the slime mold, Hemitrichia. I'll whack up some images of the stages of development of this slime mold. What I'm looking for is the remnants of that orange pretzel-like network that you're looking at right now. We need to go deeper! Ah! There you can make out some slight remnants of the plasmodial network, right there. Well, I can't point to it, I'll do that in post. But it looks like they've just congregated and are beginning to sporulate. But ain't that a purdy image? And they are indeed sometimes called the pretzel slime mold because the network does resemble a pretzel. Makes me hungry. And here we have our delicious elderberries. Looking forward to encumbering myself with them in a moment, but let's talk about elder. Different species of elder and certain lookalikes of elder. This particular genus and species of elder is Sambucus nigra, which is the go-to common species throughout the UK. But be weary for my American friends in particular, as I do believe there is a plant that looks nearly identical to elderberry. And that plant is called pokeweed, otherwise known as American nightshade. Quite similar in that they have dark black fruits and a bright purpley red stem. Different arrangement though, but it can be mistaken for elderberry for those who are unfamiliar. 
Pokeweed is a toxic plant. Various toxic alkaloids and saponins is what's on the table with pokeweed. The seeds inside the fruit of pokeweed also contain a chemical known as a lectin, which there's a big fancy description for what that does, but the long and short of it is that it inhibits protein synthesis within our bodies. Sounds bad, right? It is bad. Lectins are also found in ricin. You may be familiar with ricin. That shit is deadly, which is extracted from the seeds of the castor oil plant, ricinus communis, just FYI. It's annoying because all of the toxins of pokeweed are found in the leaves, root, stems, bark and seed of the fruit. Not so much in the actual fruit itself, so you can't just chow down on them. But yeah, mistaking pokeweed for elderberry isn't fun times. Now elder and elderberries within this country are regarded as edible when they're ripe, when they're totally dark purple bordering on black. If they're red or green, they're inedible and toxic. But there are various species of elder across the world that are a bit toxic even when they are ripe, so you've got to do your homework on your local species. It's always recommended that you cook elderberries and all species of elder just to be totally 100% safe, because the toxin that lingers in amongst this tree is cyanide. Ooh, should resonate with you? Cyanide, yo. Well hydrogen cyanide and cyanogenic glycosides, which are the toxins of concern. Lots of nasty chemicals today. Hope I'm not fear-mongering. Introducing these bad boys from the genus of Silaria, the dead man's fingers. Possibly, possibly you say. Dead man's fingers is the common name for one specific species, Silaria polymorpha. Other species aren't called dead man's fingers in the mycology world. That's why I don't like using the common names for things. Encourages some slight misidentification, but it's okay, because it only really matters when you dig down the rabbit hole. But Xylaria is the genus these black fingers belong to. Sounds exotic. They're not considered edible due to being so tough, and trying to bite it, it feels like pure meat gristle. Very hard, very dense, slightly rubbery. Not considered toxic, though. Although there have been some alleged reports of dogs chewing down at FUCK OFF! There's a wasp, man! Ah! Not considered toxic though, although there have been a few alleged reports of dogs chowing down on them and then experiencing nausea, but that doesn't necessarily mean that us humans will experience similar effects. Won't always look like this, however. For those of you that were out in the spring, you may have came across them while they look like this. Pale blue with a white spot on top. That's a very young Xylaria polymorpha. Later in the year though, they start to blacken with melanin-type pigment and resemble fingers. Figured I'd cover it in case there were any bros or broesses out there that were curious as to what these little things that look like bits of dead seaweed are. It's that time of year, Blackberry City out here. Gives me diabetes just looking at the abundance of them. Not complaining though, perhaps the cheekiest of all nibbles. Dem raw, organic, hand-picked, fresh blackberries. Expensive, free out here though. Waitrose can go suck a dick. Can't walk anywhere without getting stuck on blackberry brambles. Getting holes in my ankles. Why is nothing ever easy out here? Round one, get through this, then go for seconds, and thirds, and fourths, like a fat bastard. Who am I to deny mother nature? It would be quite rude of me to decline such a bounty. Got my gallium aparine coffee, whipped up another batch. Got sunshine, basking in the rays. Pretty content, man. Beats the hell out of eating worms and drinking rainwater during a thunderstorm, that's for sure. I've got fruit for days. Well, one evening, but that's good. I've eaten so much that I feel like I'm gonna pop. So, it may beg the question, how are you gonna deal with digesting all this fruit? Typically, a consequence of eating a ton of fruit is digestive issues, to put it bluntly, you goddamn shit yourself. Sorry for being abrupt, but one way to avoid this issue is to obviously eat foods that are high in dietary fiber, right? You've heard that all your life, okay? Where are we gonna find that in the wild? Well, dietary fiber, by definition, is the undigestible portion of food from plants. So if you think back to Campus X9 and 10 where I spoke about plant stems containing a lot of cellulose, which is indigestible to us humans, Cellulose, by definition, is dietary fibre. So if you want a diet high in fibre, 
chow down on plant stems, although make sure it's a non-toxic plant. In this example, I'm chowing down on burdock stems. Little trick of the trade, right there. And when it comes to breakfast cereals, for example, that are advertised as being high in fibre, they typically contain hemicellulose, more specifically hexosane and pentosane. They are the indigestible portions of wheat, barley and oats, etc. Fibre in fungi is called casein, so you know it's everywhere. Fibre does wonders for your digestive system, especially if you're encumbering yourself with fruit. Little trick of the trade, right there. Ah, oh, these babies. They're so hard to find, they're so small, it's only when you really stop to sit down to examine something else do you notice these little fellas chilling. Setting up shop amongst all the leaf litter, but these are parachute mushrooms, either belonging to the genus of Merasmus or Gymnopus. My on the fly identifier, actually hold up, should start abbreviating that. My OTFI is either Merasmus rotula, otherwise known as the collared parachute, or Gymnopus andrasaceus, the horsehair parachute. The only way to find out is to look at the underside of the cap. There, all shall be revealed. The collared parachute, Merasmius rotula, has a bit of a collar. The gills are attached to that collar. The whole ensemble resembles that of a wagon wheel in ways. The horsehair parachute, Gymnopus andrasaceus, the gills are attached directly to the stem. You can just about see that the gills are attached to the collar. So I would say this is the collared parachute, Merasmius rotula. They're not considered edible, they are so small that they're not even worth consideration. No medicinal value as far as I'm concerned, but I figured I'd mention this because... God damn aeroplanes, man. Uh, I figured I'd cover this because I just want to say they're not magic mushrooms to the untrained eye. Any small, thinly stemmed mushroom does kind of get the magic mushroom cogs turning. Ever seen a slime mold get mouth banged by a plant stem? Probably not. I like to think I'll bring the fresh shit. Call me for breeze. Enteridium lycopodon, ladies and gentlemen. Fancy mixing it up a bit, you know. Want to enjoy the blackberries for a different medium, so I busted the bread! Picked this off the Whiticus breadicus tree. White bread, I know. Bad for you. Couldn't find the Brownicus breadicus tree. But we're gonna make toast, and we're gonna turn some blackberries into a half ass jam. Jam on toast, yo. We pimpin'. So the plan is, turn this into a kind of jelly-like jam. Squish it up and warm it up. Easy life. Next level, toast creating apparatus. Well, that really took no time at all. Didn't quite anticipate it toasting so quickly. Kinda burnt. That's one side done. Let's flip it. Who would have thought four temp pegs would be so useful? And there we go. Now to make the jam. Oh yeah, look at that. That's nice and thick, kind of jelly-like. Nice jam. Well, I say it's jam, but all I guess it really is is warm, squished up blackberries. Close enough, I guess, it will have to do. Chow down on this, then we'll crack on. Resume the antics. It's a bit wet out here, boys. Just a little bit. Fuck! Oh. 